Before we go into today's topic, um, I thought that we would get into um, some of the more recent news that came out um, with a new species called Homo luzonensis from Luzon Island in Southeast Asia. It's uh, close to Malaysia. Um, it's supposedly a new species. Um, researchers found several teeth and finger bones with lower limbs that they claim look like an australopithecine and upper limbs that look like a Homo erectus, and it was found uh, alongside stone tools, right? So what we're really seeing here is just a unique morphology um, that occurs on an island context, right? Remember, we've talked about it from the very beginning of the semester, how islands do interesting things to creature speciation. So if we look at kind of the um, differences here, so this is showing you a modern human all the way on the left here, um, showing you it's kind of, you know, modern human teeth are a bit smaller. Um, if you look at kind of Homo erectus on the right versus um, Homo luzonensis here on the, uh, the kind of the middle picture here, it, it, they're basically the same morphological tooth size, right? So this is really just a Homo erectus that has some interesting morphology because it evolved on an island context. So um, chapter 12 and 13 tend to jump around an awful lot because um, primarily with uh, early Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, there's a huge degree of interaction between those two groups, right? We have sites where we know that they were living alongside each other at the same site at the same time. We even have instances where we think that they may have been breeding with um, one another. We'll talk about the, um, you know, some of those kind of interesting um, studies. Um, so we kind of jump back and forth between talking about Homo sapiens and um, Neanderthals. So if we look at kind of our fossil hominin human family tree here, right, we started out with our Artipithecus group talking about Arty, our Aurorantugonensis, as well as some others. Then we talked about our Australopithecine group talking about um, our kind of robust Australopithecines, which are really um, same thing here. That's what your Paranthropus group is. Um, so these are all essentially incorporated kind of in the same grouping system if you're a lumper. Um, and then we kind of move to the genus Homo, right? We talked a little bit about the earliest members, which is Homo habilis here and Homo erectus. But now we're going to talk about kind of uh, these these individuals here, right? Our Homo uh, neanderthalensis as well as our Homo sapiens. So if we look at the progression of tool types here, the oldest tool type that we have, of course, we've said is the Oldowan tool type. It was first made by Homo habilis and was used for marrow extraction, right? These tools were not used for hunting. These, at this point, Homo habilis was simply a scavenger. So your Ashleyan tools uh, are made by Homo erectus. They date um, from about 1.6 to about 90,000 years ago. Um, still used for scavenging at this point, right? These are large, kind of big, clunky um, hand axes that really wouldn't function well on the end of a spear. So at this point, they're still using them for scavenging. So there's really no um, cooperative hunting happening, or at least at the sites that are using exclusively Ashleyan tools. So if we look at the uh, next kind of stage of tool production um, that we see kind of in an evolutionary sense, we have the Mousterian tools made by Homo neanderthalensis. Um, they were used for hunting as well as making clothing. They were, of course, more refined spear points. This is where we actually have, um, you know, little uh, stone points that can be placed on the end of a spear and function quite well. And they were used to hunt reindeer and ancient horses. It's important to understand, though, at this point, we don't have the bow and arrow, right? The bow and arrow is actually a relatively late invention in terms of technological cultural inventions. And of course, later on in time, as we get to those upper Paleolithic Homo sapiens, we have the Salutrian um, spear points. Right? These are very, very refined spear points using the, something that we call the Levela technique, which you can actually see um, pretty clearly on this point here right in the middle. 
um, these long channels that are taken out of the surface, right? This is when they're chipping it. They're actually removing very large, long flakes, right? That's what's known as the level law technique. We find them in Europe and North America, and it's really with our Salutrian tool system in our modern Homo sapiens that we see the first true um, arrowheads, right? So the kind of important distinction is that we really don't have much evidence that Neanderthals were using the bow and arrow. They may have been using it with uh, bone tools. Um, we're not 100% sure, but it's not until we get to kind of um, Homo sapiens that we see the real first um, arrowheads. So this is just showing you the differences in kind of what we see in Salutrian tools. Um, some of them have no fluting. There's actually a haft on the bottom of the stone point where they can stick it into a uh, wooden spear or a bone uh, arrow or arrow shaft or something like that. Um, you also have another technique called fluting where you remove very large kind of channel flakes at the bottom there. Um, and what that does is you do that on both sides until it's nice and paper thin so you can stick it into a wooden shaft. Um, same kind of basic concept works with the um, thinning technique where you just thin the base all the way down. And of course you would affix these once you stick them into the spear or arrow shaft, um, you would kind of use sinew or some sort of binding or some sort of adhesive agent to um, cemented in the into place. Um, another thing that we find during these uh, with these upper, upper Paleolithic cultures is the use of micro blades, right, which are sharpened stone implements that are actually attached to either wood or bone that are used for um, specifically cutting hides. So if we look at kind of one of the hallmarks of what we consider something to be distinctly human, right, aesthetic or a concept of art, right? We talked about how there might have been evidence of art as early as Homo erectus around 430,000 years ago, but we also have something interesting from 600,000 years ago um, called the Tan Tan Sculpture, right? It's not really confirmed. Um, as a matter of fact, microscopic analysis shows that these markings on, these, on the sculpture are not really um, old and they're not made by humans. Um, and they also know, you know, when they found this, it was found in the same layer as stone tools, right? But no stone tool markings were actually made on the object itself. So was this a, a totem that was carried around? Um, was it just a random piece of rock that was sitting there? We're not 100% sure. We have another sculpture um, that dates around 280,000 years ago called the Barakat Ram, and it's the kind of first deliberate sculpture that's ever been made. Um, it's made of a volcanic scoria, which is a kind of volcanic rock, and it supposedly resembles a woman, and the lines that you can see featured here around the neck where that thinning is, those are, uh, due to microscopic uh, analysis, we know that those were made by human hands. And uh, to me, this is one of the first kind of real definitive pieces because you can actually tell um, what the artwork is. It was found in the Dordogne region in France, and it dates to around 27,000 years ago. And it's considered to be um, what they would call a fertility statue, kind of holding a ram's horn, which is kind of an ancient sign of fertility, as well as featuring a woman who is pregnant. So as we make this shift, um, and we, I know we haven't really talked about when and where modern humans have kind of, or even archaic Homo sapiens have evolved, um, but what changes really occur between this kind of transition from archaic to modern humans, right, from the first time we arise in the fossil record to how we are today, the general patterns that we see are our postcranial bones become more gracile, so in essence our uh, skeleton becomes a little thinner. The crania are less robust. The features that are on our skeleton, like our brow ridge, our zygomatic arches, our chins, everything like that becomes less robust. The modern brain size is between 1450 and 1750 cc's, and the average brain size today um, is around 1450 cc's. So we're actually going down in uh, brain size a little bit. And I don't want you guys to get the kind of uh, misconception that brain size directly corresponds to intelligence, right? It's not necessarily the size of the brain that matters, but how that brain is organized. So if we line up kind of uh, these South African modern Homo sapiens or these archaic Homo sapiens that, specimens that we have and these Israeli uh, archaic Homo sapien specimens that we have, we notice that you know even though there's a huge degree of geography between those two areas, there's not a whole lot of change going on between these 
uh, specimens, right? So uh, essentially what we're saying is that, you know, modern Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens in general evolved in Africa and spread out very, very quickly. So if we look at early modern Homo sapiens in Africa evolving at or around 200,000 years ago to about 6,000 years ago, we have a few different sites. We have the Huerto site, the Aduma, and the Bori sites in the middle Awash region of Ethiopia. So you guys can kind of see how important this East Africa uh, middle Awash region was for our evolutionary history, right? We also have uh, specimens from Omo. Um, are the oldest, which are uh, date to around 160,000 years ago. It's likely that modernization, that transition from being an archaic to a modern Homo sapien, happened in East Africa and spread out from there to the entire continent. If we look at the Omo specimens, we say that they're anatomically modern humans due to the kind of high um, forehead and the kind of um, larger cranial vault that we see. The brow ridge itself is present, but as you can see, is very, very much reduced over uh, earlier Homo erectuses and even uh, contemporaneous Homo neanderthal ensuses. If we look at the Bori site, these are fully modern Homo sapiens that date to around 130,000 BP. It's a possible site of Homo erectus and Homo sapien interaction. And this comes from the uh, Middle Awash Afar region in Ethiopia as well. We also have another um, Holocene period site dating from between six to uh, uh, nine to six thousand years ago, the Clasius River Mouth Cave site. It still is a mixture of features, but predominantly um, modern Homo sapien. If we look at early modern Homo sapiens in Asia, we, of course, we have more coming from our Zhao Kaodian cave system. These finds date from 90,000 years ago to around 18,000 years. They're generally more robust, but modern humans in terms of their features, right? So they have a little bit of a brow ridge going on here. Um, but in terms of the cranial vault, how high the forehead is, um, how reduced these zygomatic arches is, um, everything is distinctly um, modern human. So if we look at early modern Homo sapiens in Europe, um, they date from between 35,000 years ago to 15,000 years ago. Um, remember, uh, we were talking about a site called Oase II, and there's virtually no evidence of early modern Homo sapiens from Western Europe during this time period. We have a set of modern humans known as the Cro-Magnons that were found in France. Um, they lived at the same time as Neanderthals, but were much more gracile in terms of their skeletal anatomy and modern compared to that of, of uh, Neanderthals, right? So there's really no mixture of features with Cro-Magnons. So the kind of debate that your book outlines is kind of a false debate nowadays. We all fully accept Cro-Magnons as being one of the kind of the earliest members of the modern uh, Homo sapien species in um, Europe. So our Cro-Magnons were the first to be recognized as part of the modern human lineage when they were discovered in 1868, right? So remember, this isn't even that far or that long after Darwin's discovery of evolution via natural selection, right? So when you look at these Cro-Magnon specimens, you'll see a bunch in the lab as well. Um, note the reduction in the brow ridge or the superorbital torus. And if you flip the skull upside down and you look, it's the first to have kind of a scooped out maxilla, right? Which means that there's actually a little indent in the middle of the um, jaw in the top of the tooth row. So this is showing you these um, Cro-Magnon specimens, which were the first to be recognized as being kind of modern humans in Europe, right? You can see they have a very tall uh, vertical forehead, very kind of large overall brain case. Um, the zygomatic arches are nice and gracile. Um, basically, and more importantly, that maximum breadth for the skull is now at the top of the skull rather than down towards the bottom. So in essence, what we're seeing is this is kind of the culmination of that increase in brain size due to those dietary changes in Homo erectus. So our modern Homo sapiens in um, Europe were not really living at real habitation sites yet. They were living at things called rock shelters, right? And this is a, an example of a rock shelter. In essence, it's kind of an outcropping of rock that provides you with a little bit of shelter that you can kind of sit in and, you know, maybe build a fire or maybe kind of, um, uh, kind of it gives you a little bit of protection, but it's not a uh, permanent habitation site. 
So really the transition from archaic Homo sapiens to kind of our fully anatomically modern form um, really didn't involve a whole lot, right? We had a little bit of an increase in brain size from around 1,200 cc's on average in archaic Homo sapiens to around 15 or 1450, which is our average today. Um, there's a little bit of a change in the, in the size of the face. There's a decrease in the size and robusticity overall. Um, and there's also a little bit of a decrease in the size and shape of the jaws. So the question is, is we talked a little bit about the out of Africa versus the multi-regional theory of kind of the development of modern Homo sapiens, right? Well, um, there's overlap between early archaic Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Um, so multi-regional cannot be correct. It's not like we evolved out of those populations. And the earliest modern Homo sapiens had Neanderthal features. So out of Africa assumes but the out of Africa hypothesis assumes that there's no gene flow between modern Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. So really, each one of these kind of hypotheses, or these theories, um, they have a little bit of evidence that back them. You know, the out of Africa has, of course, mitochondrial DNA, and the multi-regional variation um, model would really nicely accommodate for why we see um, anatomical differences in humans in terms of phenotypic expressions. But neither of them are a full and adequate explanation for why modern Homo sapiens evolved. So there's an interesting group that we've seen called the Denisovans that exist in southern Siberia, um, but they have a very interesting uh, genome, right? As a matter of fact, their genome is neither human nor Neanderthal, but we know that they shared a last common ancestor with Neanderthals, and, and morphologically, they're more closely related uh, in terms of morphology to Neanderthals. They lack a chin, they have larger brow ridges, um, but it's kind of interesting. Their unique genome was most likely the result of a vast period of wandering around the world before um, migrating and having a permanent settlement in that Siberian cave. Our Denisovans were actually fairly robust individuals, more in terms of size to what we see in Homo erectus and um, uh, in, term, in Neanderthals than compared to modern humans. Um, so morphologically, they're much, much, much more closer to um, our Neanderthals than our um, modern Homo sapiens are. Um, but it's kind of interesting. You're going to see in the next couple of photos that there are some distinct differences, right? Their teeth are a lot larger. Their skull sizes are a lot larger. Um, and, you know, when we do the skeletal reconstructions, we can see that they look very much more similar to a Neanderthal than they do a human. So the questions that we'll be kind of considering um, during this presentation is what do Homo sapien fossils reveal about modern human origins, right? How is variation in our own Homo sapien fossil record interpreted, right? And what other developments took place, right? We, we talked about the major one, which was the shift to bipedal locomotion, right? We talked about the second major one, which is the development of stone tools, right? But where do we go from here? Early uh, modern Homo sapiens are divided generally into four uh, major cultural groups uh, during this time period. They're also known as Upper Paleolithic people. And the culture groups are based on similarities in tool types as well as burial practices and art. I don't expect you guys to know um, specifically the four different culture groups. I just want you to kind of uh, look at the time periods as well as kind of the geographic associations, right? So this is what we see in the Upper Paleolithic period um, in Europe, um, kind of in the last 50,000 years. So in terms of kind of our Upper Paleolithic tools, by the time we get to Homo sapiens, right, whether we're looking at archaic versus modern Homo sapiens, um, we have kind of two different tool types that begin to emerge, right? If we're looking at Homo neanderthalensis, right, these are uh, a tool type that we call Mousterian tools, um, as well as bone tools. If we're looking at our Homo sapiens, they use something we refer to as Salutrian tools. The important thing here is that the tools, whereas they're all made from the same materials that earlier Ashley and Oldowan tools um, were made from, during this time period we see no more um, Ashleyan or Oldowan tools. If we look at some of the unanswered questions that we still have regarding our 
uh, Neanderthals. Um, will more studies of Neanderthal DNA help us identify what is unique about the modern human genome compared to that with our closest relatives? Is there a correlation between climate change and the extinction of Neanderthals, or was competition with modern humans the most important factor? Was the relative contribution or what was relative contribution of animal and plant sources to the average Neanderthal diet? And were Neanderthals routinely symbolic, right, making ornamental or decorative objects burying the dead, or did they just uh, occur in specific populations? If the latter is the case, why did those populations exhibit these behaviors, right? And what was the relationship between Neanderthals and the Denisovans, right? We just don't know. So we'll see as time unfolds. If we look at some of the cranial characteristics of our anatomically modern humans, right, of course, we have the high vertical forehead as well as the round and tall skull, the small superorbital torus and small dentition, as well as something called facial neoteny, right, the spacing between the uh, proportions on our face, essentially the spacing between the eyes, the nose and the mouth has gotten smaller over time. If we look at the cranial characteristics of Archaic Homo sapiens, on the other hand, we have a longer and lower cranial vault, a larger supraorbital torus, less facial neoteny. There's an occipital bun, which is a protruding uh, part of the occipital bone on the back of the skull. There's a smaller chin as well as larger dentition, right? So you can see that there are some differences between Archaic versus modern Homo sapiens. But by the end of the upper Pleistocene period, we start to see Homo sapiens specimens with a mixture of archaic and modern cranial features, right? So if we look at the example, we have school uh, number five, which has a forward-facing face, right? Pronounced superorbital torus, right? So still big brow ridge, had a distinctive chin, right? So we have a brow ridge, which is more archaic. We have a distinctive chin, which is more modern. There's no occipital bone, which is more modern. And this uh, particular individual or the specimen was found in Israel, right? So it's right in that kind of interaction area between where um, modern Homo sapiens and archaic Homo sapiens may have been interacting with one another. So we have three main hypotheses as to why um, we have the development of modern Homo sapiens. Of course, we have the out of Africa model, which we've mentioned briefly. Um, we also have the multi-regional continuity model and the Toba catastrophe theory. And we'll, we'll look at each of these in a little bit of detail. The out of Africa model um, asserts that modern Homo sapiens evolved in Africa, moved out and replaced earlier archaic Homo sapien populations, right? And the evidence for this is uh, besides the comparison of fossil evidence, there's a study from Cambridge University that traces all modern human Y chromosomal and mtDNA back to Africa. So the out of Africa hypothesis, the kind of uh, problem or kind of issue that we have with it is that mtDNA lineages have a very high rate of turnover in humans, right? Some mtDNA lineages can go extinct in as little as three generations, right? So there may be a whole host of genetic information or DNA information that we can use to trace that may simply not exist anymore. So really saying that, well, maybe all modern humans today come from Africa, they may not be saying that all humans in general in our evolutionary history have come from Africa. So we also have the multi-regional continuity model, which asserts that the transition to modernity and archaic Homo sapiens occurred regionally and without wide-scale replacement. So the transition occurred independently in Africa, Asia, and Europe, right? Apart from the fossil record, we have intermediate fossil specimens found in both Australia, China, and India. And this is also based on the contemporary evidence for gene flow or what we have observed as terms of gene flow between human populations, right? So what this is really saying is that, you know, archaic Homo sapiens left Africa, moved out to different parts of the world. Um, this, you know, if you ex ex stretch this kind of to its extreme, it says, that, you know, maybe even out of Homo erectus populations, these different Homo sapiens evolved. And out of those different Homo sapien populations evolved modern Homo sapiens. So if we have kind of um, 
this really good explanatory model called the multi-regional continuity model. Why is um, the out of Africa hypothesis still so popular, right? Well, it's an extremely simple explanation and the early proponents of our regional model linked it to the existence of races, essentially saying that they can prove the existence of races using this model. Um, and it places modern humans above all earlier forms, right? That kind of notion of essentialism that we are, or that kind of notion of exceptionalism as well, that we are kind of modern humans are, are set apart from the rest of everything. And the multi-regional issues uh, continuity model has issues with continuity, right? Early archaic Homo sapiens and Neanderthals overlap quite extensively, right? So kind of what's part of that multi-regional model is that they evolved out of earlier populations, right? And that overlap or how extensive that overlap was, is kind of throws a uh, wrench in that kind of reasoning. We also have the Toba catastrophe theory. Um, I don't really talk a whole lot about it because, well, uh, to be honest, there's there's not really much um, evidence for it. There's actually no evidence for it. Um, but you'll find it out there um, in the literature, right? So uh, in essence, this uh, proposes that a volcanic event that happened at or around 75,000 years ago caused a worldwide volcanic winter to happen, right? And this event causes a bottleneck of archaic Homo sapien populations out of which came the modern um, Homo sapiens, right? And this is just the same thing as Swan Brow's, um, you know, notion of the Big Bang Theory, that Homo habilis populations bottlenecked, and out of that came um, Homo erectus and later Homo sapiens. Unfortunately for the Toba catastrophe theory, um, when we look at kind of the fossil record and surrounding islands, we don't even really have much of a disturbance that we see in um, the kind of animal and um, plant life. So in essence, the whole notion of there being a volcanic winter Eh, it doesn't really hold. There was a very large volcanic eruption. We do know that happened, but in terms of it causing a volcanic winter, uh, most likely it did not. So if we look at our archaic Homo sapiens, right, these are the first to evolve at or around 350,000 years ago. The transition to fully modern or fully anatomically modern Homo sapiens occurred by or was completed by 25,000 BP, right? So if we look at some of our examples here, of course, we have the Bodo skull as well as Cobwe and Herto. So if we go off of our multi-regional continuity model, um, it would say that our archaic Homo sapiens evolved from Homo erectus in three distinct continental settings, Africa, as well as Asia, as well as Europe. And so remember, this kind of fits well because Homo erectus traveled all over the globe, right? So it would make sense that kind of these archaic Homo sapiens may have evolved out of Homo erectuses in these three different settings. If we look at our archaic Homo sapiens in Africa, of course, we notice right away that they have very large brow ridges, right? Um, the specimen we're looking at here is called the Cobwe skull that comes from the Cobwe lead mine in Zambia. Um, they have enormous superorbital toruses. They have smaller muscle attachment sites on the posterior of the skull as compared to Homo erectus, right? So we're seeing a push in that trait more towards um, kind of uh, modern Homo sapiens, right? And they had a larger cranial capacity than Homo erectus at 1300 cc's. If we look at archaic Homo sapiens specimens in Asia, we have the Nagandong site in the island of Java. So of course, more specimens from Java. We only really have just a couple of brain cases from this site, but the Nagandong uh, number 11 cranial capacity is around 1100 cc's, right? So definitely larger than that of a um, Homo erectus, right? And the skulls would have had uh, robust features similar to earlier archaic Homo sapiens that we find in those Zhao Kaodian cave systems in China as well, right? So they're right along uh, what we would expect for an archaic Homo sapien. So we also have kind of a uh, mosaic of features that we see in some of these uh, Chinese archaic Homo sapien specimens. We have Zirin Cave in China, which has a very, very thick mandible, which is a very archaic feature, but has a protruding chin, which is an anatomically modern feature. Uh, the dates that we have from here are around 100,000 BP. It's kind of a little tentative um, because it's done through relative dating. And it's a fragmentary fossil, so we're just not really 100% sure. But we know that if this morphology holds true, that this would be an intermediate fossil showing good features that were halfway between that of archaic Homo sapiens and modern Homo sapiens. 
So we have more that comes from our Zhao Kaodian cave system that dates from 29,000 to 24,000 BP. Um, these are robust compared to that of modern Asians in terms of cranial features. So the brow ridges are a little bit bigger. The um, uh, muscle attachment sites for the jaw are a little bit larger. Um, the uh, thickness of the bone is a little bit uh, larger, but it has flat facial proportions that were consistent uh, consistent with modern Eastern Asian populations, right? So this is a kind of a direct link we can see between uh, kind of Homo sapiens in Asia and kind of modern people that live in Asia. We also have more that comes from that Cima de los Huesos site. Um, remember we talked about that's the place that had one of the first kind of uh, mixtures of erectine and um, Neanderthal and Homo sapien features. We have the Atapuerca number five skull, which had a cranial capacity of 1,125 cc's. It was the first to display Neanderthal-like facial features, had a very, very large superorbital torus, and a lar had a larger brain and more rounded skull as compared to Homo erectus, right? So what we're seeing here is kind of that push towards um, the development of Neanderthalensis. So if we look at the late Homo sapiens that we see in Europe, we have the Pistera cu Oase site in Romania. This is the earliest um, true modern Homo sapiens in Europe or he, modern humans. Uh, the Oase II skull uh, has modern features, but contemporary with that of Neanderthals. Dates to around 35,000 BP. Had a very reduced superorbital torus, general gray style features, and the MT DNA from the specimen traces back to Africa. But we know, and we find in the same soil layers, in the same rock layers, we also find Neanderthal bones. So we know that this is a fully modern human living alongside at the same time in the same place with Neanderthals in uh, Western Romania. And finally, England has some um, ancient human Homo sapiens that they can claim as their own, much more than just simply a, a tibia from Boxgrove. We have the Swanscombe site in England, right, which is a gravel pit site, likely an old rock shelter or a cave. The specimens found here had very large, rounded cranial vaults with a cranial capacity of around 1,200 cc's. And the other finds we have um, in Europe at the time, or uh, that we have found in Europe, are um, places in France at the Arago site, we have Steinheim in Germany, as well as Petrolona, Greece. As a matter of fact, the um, British were so excited about finding an archaic Homo sapiens specimen in uh, Swanscombe, England, that they erected a large Ashleyan hand axe in the uh, kind of uh, local park. The kind of problem is, is that the, the people, those specimens from Swanscombe were archaic Homo sapiens, so they weren't really making Ashleyan hand axes. So in terms of the dietary adaptations that kind of began with Homo erectus that have kind of continued onward with Homo sapiens, in general, the face, the jaws, and the teeth, particularly the molars, are very much reduced in Homo sapiens. This reduction may correspond to reduced selective pressure for larger dentition, right? The result, uh, this is a result of a change in diet, right? Or in essence, less mastication, right? So remember that evolutionary feedback loop that we had for Homo erectus, right? Better hunting leads to higher protein diets, to larger body mass, which is more effective learning, greater sociability, which leads to better stone tools, right? What we can prove during this time period is that um, dental wear on the front teeth uh, increased in archaic Homo sapiens, right as we began to do things like make clothing and make uh, bone tools, right? We start to notice that we begin to use our teeth as tools as well. So if we look at one of our specimens, we have that Atapuerca number five, right, which uh, is actually in the textbook listed as a Homo heidelbergensis, but we're going to call it a uh, Homo erectus. Um, we have extreme dental wear on the incisors, right, on that first front tooth there. You can kind of see the change in color between where the root of the tooth stops and the enamel of the tooth begins, right? So there's a lot of dental wear on those. So it's actually evidence of teeth as tool. So there's a higher reliance during this time period on the anterior dentition for things like uh, weaving, uh, for things like uh, ripping stone or ripping uh, hides apart, um, as well as kind of